If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians and chapter 2. Reading from verse 1. <clears throat> it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, Beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work. This morning I wanted to talk about sin. And I wanted to speak about or start with what it talks about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the falling away. But to talk about the falling away, I have to sort of give a, a short overview of what he's talking about here and you know, the prophetic timeline, and I hope, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because, Lord willing, this will be covered on Wednesday when we, as we go over the book of Thessalonians. But, as way of overview, the Bible talks about three groups of people. It talks about the nations, or the Gentiles, it talks about Israel, and it talks about the church. Now, God has provided a prophetic timeline to the nations. That's Daniel chapter 2, when he gave Nebuchadnezzar the vision, or the dream, of the image with the different metals, you know, the head of gold and the arms and the chest of silver and the belly of brass and the legs of iron. And he finishes by saying, in the time of the feet, which are partly of iron and part of clay, uh, there's going to come a stone cut without hands, and it's going to land on the feet, and it's going to break in pieces the whole image that's speaking of the day of the Lord when the Lord will come and destroy the kingdom of man and establish his kingdom in righteousness that's God's prophetic timeline for the nations now God also provided a timeline to Israel that's Daniel chapter 9 and where God sent an angel to explain to him what's going to happen and that the, the, we, we, people call that the explanation of the weeks, or the 70 weeks, which is 490 years. <clears throat> and in that explanation, he says the Messiah is going to come, but he's going to be cut off. And so, when he's cut off, that's when the church is introduced. But back then, they, they had no idea what the church was. That's why Paul says the church is a mystery. The, the only uh, idea that they had that something like that was going to happen was... You know, prophecies like in Joel when he says, in, in those days I will pour out of my spirit and, you know, the young men shall see visions and the old men shall dream dreams. I'm not quoting it right, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I remember, but you, it's in Joel, the, the prophecy. 
it's Peter uh, quotes it in Acts chapter 2. That's referring to the church, but they had no idea. And so it was a mystery. But when Christ came and died and rose again, uh, the administration or the, the, um, the administration of grace began. And so God now is dealing with man through grace, offering salvation and calling everyone to him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved. But Israel's timeline is not finished. Israel's timeline is not finished yet. So the church is like a speed bump in Israel's timeline until it start, and, and when it's over, it'll start up again, which is the remaining seven years or the remaining week. And this is what it's talking about here in Second Thessalonians chapter two, when it says here in verse, let's see, verse. For the mystery, let's look at verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth, that, it might, that he might reveal, be revealed in his time, speaking of the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, or he who restrains, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So now God is, is doing a work through the Holy Spirit on the earth, calling everyone to repent and to accept his Son as their Lord and Savior. And the work that he's doing, he's restraining sin he's keeping it at bay and there's going to come a time when he's not going to be keep restraining anymore he's going to be taken out of the way we know that as the rapture when god takes his church up and the holy spirit is not on earth anymore in that same function and form the work of the holy spirit is is done because the church is gone and then begins the last seven years of israel's timeline which is the tribulation and then it ends with the day of the lord and the point I'm trying to get, to get to through all of this is that right now, God is restraining. God is holding back sin and wickedness and evil in order to give man an opportunity to repent and to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about that. Consider how crazy the world has gotten. You know, I, I wrote a list of things down, of examples of how crazy the world has gotten. But after I wrote the list, I saw a video on YouTube. And it's a, it's a series called, It's Time to Leave Earth. And um, this person, he, 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 every week he posts the, the, the craziest stories of the week. And he posts it on YouTube. And this time, the most sane story, the most normal story out of the bunch was the story of a mayor of some town who married an alligator. And they went to a church and everything and they made a, a, a white pretty dress and a hat and everything and a veil for the alligator and they went to a church and the, this mayor married an alligator. And someone in the comments, they summed it up nicely. They said, you know, <clears throat> Look at how this world has gotten when the most sane story in this video is a story of a man marrying an alligator. And I assure you, the other stories were absolutely crazy. <laughs> that's, that's where we are in the world today. Okay? And when you think about God restraining sin, restraining sin, can you imagine what's going to happen when he's not restraining sin and keeping it at bay anymore? So the point of this is, is for us to see how bad sin is and how de destructive it is and how devastating it is to the world, to us. That's the point of all of this, you know. Sin is evil. Sin is wicked. Sin is the, one of the worst things you can think of. But because we're in this body and we have a sinful nature, we, we sort of forget that because, you know, we practice sin. It's in us until one day when God will change us and we'll be in Christ's image. And then we can finally say, okay, we're done with sin. But until then, you know, we have to deal with that. It's, it's in our bodies. It's, it's, we're born with it, thanks to the curse of Adam. But it's important to understand that just because it's around us and because it's in us and, you know, when we go to work and we go to school or we go outside, you know, we see it every day. That doesn't make it okay. 
And that the danger is to get used to sin and to get used to evil and to get used to wickedness. And then to say, well, it's okay. Because, you know, I'm used to it and I'm around it all the time. And it's very dangerous. In fact, the Bible talks about that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we'll start reading at verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what, con and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So God is calling us to be separate, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now what is a yoke? A yoke is a piece of, of, of wood or something that goes around the neck of a, a, a beast of burden to link it to another animal so that they walk in the same line. They walk together. And, you know, you could ask 10 different people, or 10 different preachers, and they'll give you 10 different explanations of what it means to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. But thankfully, you don't have to ask me. We can just look in the Bible because the Bible explains to us what it means to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. And for that, we'll turn to 2 Kings in chapter 3. Second Kings in chapter three. We'll start at verse one. Now Jehoram the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria, the eighteenth year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah, and reigned twelve years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. And Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And king Jehoram went out of Samaria at the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. This is Jehoshaphat speaking. Jehoshaphat said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey. And there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we might inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look to thee, 
nor see thee. So what does it mean to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever? We see here an evil king, Jehoram. He goes up to a righteous king, Jehoshaphat, and he says, hey, I need some help. Come, come help me fight the king of Moab. And what does Jehoshaphat say? Sure, yeah, we're, 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 we're best friends. We're, we're, your people are my people. We're all together. We're all one. We're all united. Let's go. He unequally yoked himself together with this king. And look at Elisha's response. Elisha says, if, you're not, if it were not for Jehoshaphat's presence, I would neither look to thee nor see thee. He had he wanted absolutely nothing to do with this evil king. Absolutely nothing. He wouldn't see him. He wouldn't regard him. He wouldn't inquire of him. Nothing. And yet here, what a contrast, right? You know, the man of God is saying, I don't want anything to do with you. Get away from me. And here we have <laughs> Joshua saying, oh, your people are my people. We're one. We're, we're together. We're united. That's what it means to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you start walking together with people united, you know, I, I don't know, <laughs> but Joshua must have forgotten, you know, Psalm 1 when it says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He jumped right in the way with sinners and said, yeah, let's go. We're together. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, and it's a problem today with Christians because <clears throat> they say, oh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many Christians I've seen fall into the world because they decide to make unbelievers and people from the world their friends. Now, we have to define the word friend because friend doesn't mean what it used to mean to some, or it means different things to different people. You know, but a friend is someone who you, 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 you make a part of your life, you know, that you spend time with, you communicate with, you, 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 you're with them, you're together with them, they're your friend. It's not like an acquaintance that you talk to, you know, once, a, once or twice a year, it's different. A friend is someone you make a part of your life. You know, and I, there's a brother, I, I, I use this example a lot, but a brother, a close friend, a friend of mine, well, many years ago, he decided that he was going to become friends with this guy. And I stopped seeing him, you know, I, I, or I didn't see him for like two or three months after he started hanging out with this guy. And the next time I see him, he invites me out to go eat. And we go, we go out and we sit down in the restaurant and he starts ordering beer. I'm like, what? Okay. And he's like, yeah, I, I, we go out and hang out with this guy, and we go to bars, and we go to clubs now, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what in the world are you doing? You know, what in the world are you doing? And, I, I, you know, there's, there's countless examples of that. But people, they, they, they get latched on to people from the world, and they get lost in the world. You know, we need to be like Elisha. and says, listen, I don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> get away from me. And it's understandable, and, and we need to understand that we have to live in the world. We have to go to work, we have to go to school, we have to be around sinners, we have to be around the world. But it's different to be around the world and different to be aligned with the world. You know, I hope we see that difference with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat didn't just say, yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> whatever. He, it, it wasn't a mutual thing. He, he aligned himself with Jehoram, this evil king. That's the difference. Again, think of a yoke walking together in the same line. And the Bible tells us, it calls us, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, because it says, what communion hath light with darkness? We as Christians, we're the light of the world. So why are we communing with darkness? Why are we making darkness our friend? Why, why are we, you know, hanging out with the, the, evil, the evil people and the evil things of the world. You know, I want to tell this story. When I was in Key West preaching the gospel, this couple came down from the assemblies. They're Christians. And they invited me out to eat. And I said, sure, let's go. And we started walking towards Duval Street. And anyone who knows Key West knows that Duval Street is the hub for sin and evil and wickedness in Key West. So we walk to Duval Street, and we make a we make a right, and we start walking. And down at the end, there's a lot of noise, a lot of noise, a lot of music and 
stuff. And we get closer and we get closer. Finally, we stop at this place. And the music is, is blaring. You can barely hear people talk and it's just it's crazy. The place was so packed that they were, they were you know, overflowing onto the sidewalk. And the place happened to be a bar. And this brother's like, okay, here's the place where we're going to eat lunch. And I'm thinking, are you serious? You know, they had, they had a live band playing this vile music, people dancing, people drinking, pe people getting drunk, all this crazy stuff. And then, yeah, this is where we're going to go eat lunch. And I was so shocked that I just stood there, like, thinking, what in the world? And this brother went in, tried to find some seats for us. And then he came out, and he saw the look on my face. And he said, do you have a problem eating here? And I said, yes, I do. I said, if you want to buy me lunch, I'll, I'll, I'll take it and I'll go back home and I'll eat it there, but I'm not going to eat here. You know? And he got very angry because apparently there was something wrong with me for not wanting to eat in a place like that. But thank the Lord that there was no, there was no place to sit. The place was so packed. So we got our food and we walked somewhere else quieter, more decent, and ate there. But brothers and sisters... There has, there's going to come a time in our lives when we have to, we have to draw the line and say, listen, I'm, that's it. I'm not going to cross the line. I'm not going to go do that. I'm not going to go to that place. I'm not going to, 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 to be involved with these people. You know, we, we have to draw that line because God has called us to be holy, to be separate from sin. You know, and it's important to understand that because, again, we're surrounded by sin. And we, we, get, we can get used to it, even, you know, even the sin that's in us. And, and, and we say, oh, well, it's okay, it's not, it's not too bad. And, and slowly, that's how sin works. Sin doesn't come in all at once and, and, and just radically change you. Sin comes in little by little, little by little, little by little. And it slowly changes you and slowly corrupts you, you know. And thinking about all of this, you know, the hand of God is restraining the sin and wickedness in the world. And when that hand is removed and the, the, the Antichrist comes on the scene, I mean, it's going to be crazy. You know, that's, thankfully, the Lord is going to start, you know, judging the world. It's called the time of tribulation. But it's going to be absolutely insane during that time. It's going to be so bad. Mankind is going to gather together armies to fight God. I mean, think about that. Think how crazy that is. They're going to get together and fight against God because they hate God so much they don't want anything to do with Him. That's what's going to happen during the tribulation. Because God ha God's hand is going to be removed and people just want to do sin. People just want to do evil. You know? It's crazy. But the, but the thing about sin too is that sin just doesn't affect you when you're committing sin. It affects you even when you're not the one committing the sin. It just has to be around you. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 7 Peter's talking about Lot verse 7 it says 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 7 he says and delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed or tortured his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was a righteous man. It's important to no one to remember that. Because this is a side note, by the way. I don't think I've ever heard a message concerning Lot that speaks of Lot in a good light. And we need to be very careful with that because God has already judged and determined that Lot was a righteous man. You know, why did he go down into Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible doesn't say. It says he pitched his head towards Sodom. What was in his head, we have no idea. But we know that him being in Sodom wasn't good for him. He vexed, he tortured his soul being in that place with all the sin and wickedness surrounding him. In fact, God got him out of there because he was righteous. That's the whole point of him getting him out, because he's a righteous man. 
And yet, being around that sin and that evil and that wickedness affected him. It tortured his soul, it says. And we need to be careful to get away from sin and wickedness. You, you know, you don't have to be sinning to be affected by sin. It, just being around it is bad enough. Because sin affects us. Even just being around it. We need to be very careful with that. You know, unfortunately, not all of Lot's family, you know, left Sodom unscathed. We see his daughters. And look how they were corrupted by Sodom. And because of their sin, we have Moab and we have Ammon. They were their kids that they had by uh, incest with their father. And Moab and Ammon turned out to be the enemies of God and the enemies of Israel. And they were always fighting with Israel, fighting against God. The effects of sin. We need to be very careful where we go, what we do, who we associate with. Because sin affects us. We need to be very careful with that. You know? It, and, and it's something that's hard to hear. But wherever you may be, if, you go to, if you're in a school that's a bad school, we have someone going to college now, and the school turns out to be bad, get out. Find another school. If you're in a job and the job is bad and there's sin all over the place and it's affecting you, get out. Find another job. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that heaven and eternity was to come is far more important than anything this world has to offer, whether it be education, a paycheck, whatever. You know? Far more important. Because that's eternal. That's something that, that people struggle to grasp. The eternity of what's to come. It's not temporary like everything here and now. You know? There's going to come a time when you're not going to get a paycheck anymore. There's going, to tire, there's going to be a time when there's not going to be, you know, a, a place to work, a, a school to go to. It's not going to be done away with. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. This earth isn't even going to be here anymore. There's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. Why? Because righteousness has to reign. And this world is tainted with sin and wickedness. Absolutely corrupted by it. And unfortunately, a lot of people, they don't realize it because they, they live in a little bubble, you know, and they, they, they're not paying attention to, the, to what's going on in the world. And so they don't, they don't pay attention to when, when they're in the presence of sin and stuff like that, you know. And, and they stumble. We need, to be pay, we need to be paying attention. The, Bible, the, the Lord Jesus Christ said to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You ever seen a snake? A snake is always looking and watching and, he, 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 you know, he looks, very, he looks very wise and he looks like he's ready to, to, to jump on you at any time. We need to be paying attention to, to the things that are going around us. You know, the things that are happening in the world. So we know, hey, look, this is bad, this is good, I need to stay away from this, I need to stay away from that. If not, then we're going to get caught off guard. The Bible talks about being sober and waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being sober is being ready, you know, being attentive, being, you know, Paying attention. There are too many Christians who aren't paying attention to what's going on around them. And that's not, that's, that's not what God calls us to do. He calls us to, to be Christians who are paying attention to what's happening. Because if we don't pay attention, you know, we're going to get caught off guard. And we can get hurt spiritually and end up in the world or worse. We need to be very careful with that. But going back to the beginning in 2 Thessalonians, Sin, and I just want to, to, for us to see the gravity of sin and how bad it is. And, and the grace of God, really, the grace of God right now, that he's calling us through, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing that, the work of the Holy Spirit is keeping sin at bay. And God is restraining sin so that people have an opportunity to repent and to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if there's anyone here this morning, if there's anyone listening to this message who has not put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you to put your faith and trust in Him and to repent from your sin so you can have an eternity in heaven with Him and live forever in a place and in a kingdom of righteousness. You know, it's, it's, a, it's such a wonderful thing, such a wonderful hope that we have.
that we're going to be in heaven and there's not going to be any more sin. Can you, can, can, you, can you imagine that? No more sin. No more pain. No more suffering. No more crying. Because it's all going to be perfect righteousness and holiness. Because finally, God is going to be in control. Down here, man's in control right now. And what do we have? We have mayors marrying alligators. That's what we have here. It's absolute craziness. But one day, you know, that, that's what the, the books of Thessalonians are about. You know, giving hope to the church. You know, this, this world is not all there is. There's something more. There's something better coming. And that's the hope that we have as believers. The hope of being in a kingdom of righteousness. A kingdom of justice. A kingdom that's free from sin and wickedness and evil and corruption and all the bad things that this world has to offer. What a hope that we have, right? What a tremendous hope we have in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That you only have that hope if the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And once again, if you haven't repented from your sin and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, please do so as soon as possible because the day of tomorrow is not guaranteed and it's not assured. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your love for us and that you would call us through your Son to repentance and to a kingdom and to a hope that is so much better than what we have here on this earth. We thank you, Father, for your grace and that your mighty hand would restrain sin and keep it at bay, giving people, giving man an opportunity to repent and to hear the gospel and to obey the truth. What a loving God we have, Father, that you would share and shed your tremendous love upon us in such a way. But Father, we, we think of sin this morning, and we pray that you would help us to think and to meditate on the gravity of sin and wickedness and evil and how it affects us even when it's just around us on the periphery. We pray that you'd help us, Father, always to be mindful to be sober, as your word says, to, to watch, to know what's going on around us so that we can avoid sin and stay away from it, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and get lost in the world. Help us, Father, to walk on the path of righteousness. And it starts, Father, with your holy word. Help us, Father, always to be faithful and diligent, to read your word and to make it an integral part of our life. We thank you, Father, for this time this morning. We thank you, Father, for everyone who made it out. We pray and ask for your blessing as we go home now. We pray that you would keep us safe. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you.